What floor are you going to? Eleven. Really? Who are you going to see? I'm going up to interview Merle Hoffman for my school paper. Do you know her? No, I don't really know her, but I hear she's awesome. Oh, I've heard that too, but uh, let me tell you, I can put in a good word with her for you because I know her pretty well. There's been a lot of talk around school about girls who get pregnant, you know, by mistake. So I thought I'd interview you to get your side on it and write a story in the school paper, if they'll print it, you know. At school, the message is basically, don't do it, and I just want to know if there's anything else you can say besides don't. just don't <laughs> just do it. Just say no? Yeah. Well, I think just say no has become a very politically acceptable conservative type of agenda. Uh, almost like Nancy Reagan, just say no to drugs, just say no to sex. And in both of those cases, I think it's somewhat unrealistic. Uh, so what I would say is, uh, if you are going to say yes to sex or yes to intimacy, which is really what sex is, that you should say yes with responsibility. I would urge young people to think about it, particularly young women, because we uh, pay heavy prices for sex sometimes in terms of unwanted pregnancies. I'm pretty responsible about sex, I think. Um, but what does it mean to be responsible? be informed of my rights and responsibilities. About sex or about medical care? Both. I think that in sex there is a lot of responsibility and again I would stress particularly for young women because of the pregnancy issues that we're involved with. As far as being a patient, I developed a philosophy called patient power uh, about 15 years ago. See, when I first started Choices, that was in 1971. It's 24, almost 25 years ago. And uh, <laughs> I saw a lot of unwanted pregnancies because women weren't involved in their medical decisions. So I thought I would work with women and educate them as patients to say that you do have power in this relationship, in the doctor-patient relationship. It's a very intimate one. It's a very powerful one. My mom says I have to go to her doctor. Is that because of insurance, or can I come here anyway? Well, your mother, have you spoken to your mother about sex yet? Well, she doesn't really know very many things that are 90s answers, I guess. And um, it's kind of hard to talk to her because... She's so, she's in such a different generation. I know, I remember my mother came to me when I was, you know, a teenager, and she said, look, you, I really want to know, uh, I won't be upset, please, please tell me honestly, are you a virgin? And I said, well, Mommy, uh, actually, I'm not. And I had to deal with a really, really upset mother for a few years after that. So uh, your mother may want you to go to her doctor, uh, because uh, she may feel comfortable that the doctor will tell her what's going on with you. And I believe very firmly that young women should have uh, a safe, confidential relationship with a physician. So, yes, you can come to Choices. You can see our gynecologists here, and we take all types of insurance, and we also take cash. So you don't tell our parents? Well, that depends. I would prefer that you do tell your parents. Uh, if you feel that they will not be accepting, that in fact they might be not only not accepting, they might get violent or very abusive, and some parents do that, then I would suggest, no, you don't tell them. Uh, but ideally, it would be good if all parents uh, could speak to their kids. So what do you think about sex education in schools? Uh, sexuality has to do with you as an individual, as a thinking, soulful, uh, feeling person. And uh, I don't think uh, schools should or can teach those values. Ideally, they're, they're coming from the family, and the family ideally should reflect a mature, progressive society. Maybe you could come to our school sometime and talk to more kids about this. Absolutely. We have Choices has a very, very active uh, community outreach program. We have women who are counselors and educators who go out to the high schools and to the colleges and to community fairs and all types of social service agencies where we talk about birth control, sex, abortion, um, all, all sorts of uh, social progressive issues. What's this about choices in Russia? One day, uh, I think she was uh, a 32-year-old Russian woman came in here, and she came in for her 36th abortion. 36 abortions and she's 32 years old. And 
somebody like me who never gets shocked at anything. I was absolutely shocked. And I came up here and I sat at this desk and I said, I have to do something about this. And I thought, I'm going to go over there and open up a clinic. And a Russian delegation was coming here to look at certain social service organizations. And they had heard about choices. And Joy met with them on their way to the airport, I think, right? And showed them uh, the brochure and the book that I had written on birth control called ESP, The Choice is Yours, Effectiveness, Safety, Personality. Okay? And they get all excited by it because, you know, in Moscow, in Russia, there's no birth control. And if they, they do have any, maybe they have the 500,000 old copper IUDs lying around in a warehouse. So the idea of choice is off the wall to these people. And the idea of a woman choosing the type of birth control, that, that's Star Trekking. I mean, just, it was unbelievable. So they were all excited with this book. They wanted to translate it into Russian. So I said, pull out the proposal I wrote about setting up a clinic in Moscow and fax it over to them. I think a week later, I got a letter uh, inviting um, myself and nine members of my staff as a whole delegation to go over there and work in a hospital and, and teach and I mean, look for uh, opportunities to have the clinic. And we did the first Norplant insertion in Moscow. So that was an absolute great adventure, an absolute great adventure. And it was so serendipitous. I mean, like many things in life, you you think you, you can plan and you think you can control them and you think you have your whole agenda and your program set out. And then something like this just drops into your lap and all of the pieces come into place. Скорее, чем самими женщинами. As such, attitudes and behavior around abortion, birth control, and sexuality are both contextual and political. They are dependent on an economic, social, religious, and philosophical factors that rarely, rarely have the interests of women and children at heart. Религиозных и философских взглядов, которые редко имеют в виду благосостояние женщины и ее семьи. So how did you get into all this in the first place? It's a very long, interesting, circuitous story. Uh, I started out to be a concert pianist. I started out playing when I was about nine years old, and it was a natural extension for me to want to take that to the limit and to be a great artist. And from the time I was 10, 11 years old, I was practicing four or five hours a day. I studied in Paris, but slowly um, it occurred to me that that would be an extremely hermetic life. And I, I, just, I just didn't see myself um, limiting, limiting myself to that degree. So I gave up music when I was about uh, 18, 19 years old. And I really had a, an extraordinary crisis because I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, my whole life, my whole adolescence, I had planned to be an artist, and that was the world that I moved in. But then I was out of that world, and I realized that I was very interested in how I worked. And uh, as an offshoot of that, I was interested in how other people worked. So I thought to myself, well, I'll go to college and become a psychologist. But during this period of time, when I was going to college, I worked three different jobs to put my, myself through school. One of those jobs was with a physician, uh, and uh, this physician was involved with the health insurance plan, and I worked as a medical assistant. And in 1970, the abortion law changed in New York, which was three years prior to the Supreme Court decision. And the, the physician I was working with, Dr. Martin Gold, and another physician, and myself, uh, started a very small service to um, service women in the HIP plan because HIP themselves could not provide the service because the physicians were, uh, were really conflicted about how to deal with this. And it was an extraordinary time because abortion, which was uh, an issue that was political, philosophical, moral, theoretical, translated into hundreds of women lining outside of clinics to get services. So it was quite revolutionary. It was very pioneering. And, um, it was very romantic. I was totally non-political. I had no interest in the political aspect of it, but I had an interest in the psychological part of it and in the pioneering part of it. So we started out providing services for the HIV population. And uh, I was about 25 years old. 
And I'll never forget the first patient that came to Choices. She was, uh, she was about 24. She was from New Jersey. And she came from New Jersey because abortion was still illegal there. And she was terrified. And I remember <laughs> somebody saying to me, well, go in and talk to her. Go in and counsel her. And, uh, you know, I mean, what would I say? I had no experience. There was no experience. It was um, the first step in a, uh, in a great, great journey. And I remember I walked in and I looked at her and I said, you know, this is, um, this is hard for me because I, I haven't spoken to anybody about this before and I, I want to help you and I know about the procedure. And she said, it's hard for me too. And um, I went with her and I held her hand throughout the abortion and that was um, actually the motivating connection for me. So it was the connection with the women, uh, the powerful, powerful um, feeling and knowledge that I got that I was um, interacting with someone in the most vulnerable and powerful moment in their lives, which was a woman deciding whether or not to uh, continue with her pregnancy. And that connection uh, and that vision has uh, really motivated and driven my work. So my feminism uh, comes from that. It, it's basically, I like to call it, from the ground up. <laughs> I had to learn it all from the ground up and from hard knocks. So when I finally moved into this space, I thought, well, now for somebody who started where she didn't even have an office and had to have a desk and had to, you know, be pushed around and pushed about, I'll get myself a good, large office. And another funny story, in this basement, there lived an accountant <laughs> who was the accountant for choices. So I went to the accountant and I said, look, Al, his name was Al, I said, Al, uh, I'm going to move choices. I'm going to move it out of here, and I think the rent is X amount of thousands of dollars. And he looked at me and he laughed. You see, Katie, he laughed. He said, oh, you're going to move choices. You'll never be able to do it. You'll never be able to pay the rent. The P.S. to this story is that he is still in the basement. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the moral of that story is don't laugh at me. And don't say I'll never be able to do it. Do you miss playing the piano, being creative? See, actually, I would say there were two very distinct rivers running in me. One is the very creative, philosophical, contemplative, and the other is the entrepreneurial, competitive. And the entrepreneurial, competitive resulted in building choices from four patients a week to now over 50,000 a year. The artistic side and the creative side I started to give expression to in 1982 when I started to publish a newsletter called On the Issues. And like very many of the things I do start, it started from something small and, and grew and grew, and now I have uh, the magazine On the Issues, which is a quarterly. And I, it has been described as uh, one of the best intellectual feminist uh, journals there are. So that's a very uh, exciting part of my work also. You said you weren't politically motivated at first. What changed you? What really politicized me was in 1977 when Henry Hyde, do you know Henry Hyde? Not really. Oh, well, Henry Hyde still exists. He's a congressman and he had what was uh, known as in the infamous Hyde Amendment, which cut off Medicaid funds for abortion for poor women. And I was devastated because these were the women that I was dealing with every day. But what that did for me specifically was motivate me to become political. So I just got out there and uh, from that I found that I had uh, a really good ability to debate and I think that came from arguing with my mother's family who always had political philosophical where they debates they, they they grew up into major arguments but I, I held my own there so I enjoyed them so I started to go around the country and debate um, anti-choice leaders what's your favorite debate story there's one funny story I like to tell about when I debated Falwell which was, oh, yeah, early 80s in Detroit. And uh, at one point he sat there and he said, uh, Miss Hoffman, how will you feel when you have to meet your maker? And I said, well, Reverend, when I meet her, I'll be very proud because she will know that I struggled and fought for women's rights. And he got very upset. He said, her? You're saying God is a woman? You're saying God is a woman? I said, no, I'm saying God is beyond gender. So uh, that, that's really, you know, when I want, when I want to uh, reminisce and have a very good chuckle, I, I put that tape on. Isn't this you in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral? 
The St. Patrick's Cathedral action was uh, an extraordinary action. It was uh, in response to Operation Rescue. And they kept coming back to New York to invade clinics. And in 1989, they, uh, they had a major push. And Cardinal O'Connor had made statements to the effect that he supported them. He thought what they were doing was very moral and important. So I got a group of my pro-choice coalition activists. We uh, drafted a petition that we uh, actually put up on a piece of parchment like Martin Luther did in uh, the cathedral at Wittenberg to, to man that uh, abortion is a moral choice for women. So at that action, uh, seven people were arrested and uh, it made national international news and it was the first time there was a pro-choice civil disobedience action it was the first time that pro-choice women sat down on the steps of St. Patrick Cathedral and said no I am going to jail and I am making a statement for women's rights did you ever speak to Cardinal O'Connor after that? Oh, no, this is another funny story. I, uh, we did a fax. I had Rabbi Balfour Brickner, uh, one of the women from Catholics for Free Choice, the Episcopals, uh, Nayrell, and now, and I uh, faxed Car is willing, who is O'Connor's spokesperson, and I requested a meeting because I said there should be dialogue and not dissent, and I'm standing trying to fax and trying to fax this request, and the fax is totally broken. What keeps coming up on the fax number are the numbers 666, <laughs> Everybody in the office was hysterical. Oh my God, there's some devilish at work here because I think that's the number for Satan, 666. Anyway, I finally did get the fax machine working. I faxed him and his willing refused to meet with me. So I have never spoken to him directly. We have spoken through our press releases. Do you want to know about my animals? Yes. I, well, do you have any? Uh, we have three guinea pigs. Three guinea pigs? I have about 21 animals. I have yes. uh, miniature horses that I raise. I have cats, dogs, one sheep that I call lamb chop, and uh, big horses that I ride. One of my horses is called ER. It looks like your cat Waldo is your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> there is a line by Edna St. Vincent Millay that is one of my favorite lines of poetry, and she says, it's a love poem, and she said, I love your enemies because they drive you to my arms for comfort. And that is so extraordinary, and in a way, I, if I don't love my enemies, I appreciate my enemies, because they have motivated me, they have pushed me, and they have created in me passion and desire to overcome and do better. So uh, I think in a way, uh, your um, adversaries and vicissitudes of your life are a gift.